talked about some of the background for performance appraisal, but let's sit down and now look at some of the actual models that we're gonna talk about. Here we have what we call the comparative approach and there's three different types that should go through. This is really important that you understand the concept, first of all, of compare. We're gonna compare employees to each other, groups to each other. You're gonna sit down and do one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two, -two, whichever process you wanna go through, but we're gonna look at how you compare employees to each other. This has merit to it in the aspect that you start eliminating the B problem. And the B problem, I'm talking about the aspect of on a five point scale, give everybody a four because I'm such a Weasley manager. I can't sit down and make a decision what I'm supposed to do. So everybody gets a B and everybody's kind of happy. No, that's not how you operate. Frankly, if you want to have an honest performance appraisal as you go through, probably the most difficult one is ranking one on one. You got 10 employees. One's number one, one is number two, one's number three, and then somebody's number 10. Man, this is really tough because you're sitting down as a manager and you have to decide which is the single most valuable employee in your area. Ranking, frankly, is really good in the aspect of determining future leaders in the company because your future leader is going to be at the very top of your scale as you go through. But it's really kind of tough because of the fact that you have to label somebody you you're that number 10. Oh man, I don't know if I want you around. It's pretty tough to do. And it doesn't, the average manager may struggle doing that. So comparative really is tough as you go through. And of all the tough ones, ranking is probably the toughest one of all. And then you have forced distribution. You have a predetermined set of categories. Let's say on a group of 10, you have five categories. You have, you have two people in the first tier, two people in the second, all the way down to the fifth tier, that ninth and 10th people, those people. You're forced into the same thing to some extent of sitting down and saying, you, you're destined for greatness in our company, and you, you're destined for the bottom of the heap. And if we get a chance to get rid of you, you're out of here. Yeah, that's what you're doing. It's hard to do, but that really does help you identify the high potential employees. It's not quite as aggressive as ranking, but it's right up there as you go through it. Here's an example. You want to sit down <clears throat> the above average, accelerate development through challenging jobs. So those people at the top echelons, you're going to sit down and give them more opportunities. And you know what? Sometimes the people at the bottom, you're going to be missing out on opportunities for them to develop them into long-term employees in the organization because some of your top performers may go decide to leave and go top perform someplace else. So you don't know what the future holds. So that being said, here's average meets expectations. Then here's C, below expectations. In this case, the ranking is only three, A's, B's, and C's. The A people are the best people in the class and the C's. Oh, yes. So it's kind of tough as you go through. And then you have the comparison where it's kind of like you compare every employee with every other employee, kind of like two by two, but it's actually bigger than that. But you're taking this employee and look at this one, this one, this one, this one, at the other nine employees as you go through. So you're kind of pushing them as you go through. And so it becomes much more subjective and it's really time consuming. And I'm not quite certain it's as harsh as the ranking, but it's more compromising as you go through. It just depends how it's all set. The best thing about comparative, it really gets rid of that B grade for everybody. It's easy to develop and use. You kind of pit people against each other. Frankly, if you have this kind of a style, you may have a cutthroat organization, and it could be what you want as you as you as you really focus in. The one thing that really is lacks a comparative approach is you're comparing employees to each other, but you're not comparing their ability to bring your organization to the strategic goals of the organization as you go through. Yeah, you can go through and sit down and say, here's the goals we have for this year. You can use what we call management by objectives. Take four or five objectives as you go through and say, here's what we want you to accomplish. That might work, but then you do exactly the same thing for each employee as you go through. So it really is an aggressive form of actually evaluations, but you may not link it to goals and it's kind of harder to do in the process. And frankly, from my perspective, it's very divisive as you go through. Here's another one, and these are much more common in use as you go through, called the attribute approach, and there's two. So the very first one, you know, the comparative approach, we had three different ways of doing it. We, we sat down, and we let me, let me back up a little bit just for a second. We had the ranking, we had the force distribution, and then we had the paired comparison. Now we're going to be talking about the attribute approach, which we're going to use different kinds of scales, and there's two types as you go through. The graphic rating scales, 
really this uses numbers. So you sit down and crank them out as you go through and the numbers and you said, okay, this is a one, this is the two, this is a three as you go through and you evaluate people on a five point scale. Now, by the way, the five point scale comes what we call a Likert scale, which is very common in all scientific research. It's probably the best one. A five point scale is much more definitive in the, in the environment of scientific inquiry than a 10 point scale as you go through. So I recommend a five point scale on this if you're gonna develop one on your own. You start defining what a five behavior is, what a four behavior, what a three, what would you expect at each one of the points as you go through. There's a bit of work in this one because typically you're going to take the top 10 duties of a job. It just depends on the job. When you make a job description, duty number one should be the most important part of the job description. Duty number two should be the second most important and so on until you know, really after 10, you start getting into small percentage of the job. 2% of the time you do duty 11, 1% you do duty that's kind of how it works. So you take the top 10 as you go through and make a five point scale for each one. Now you can do that for each job description as you go through. And sometimes it's, it's very laborious for HR to do it or a supervisor to actually grade them as you go through. Another type of thing is it uses numbers and words. You'll see an example of this in your text as you go through, but we, we take the relevant performance dimensions and then we have a lot more verbiage that goes with it and we represent a good average and poor performance along each dimension as you go through. It's probably a better method than this, the, the graphic grading scale because there's, it's more descriptive with the words as you go through. So use numbers and words on this one over here. This is actually a very favorite in a lot of HR departments. I've actually created scales using the attribute approach using this one specifically, it, it really comes in handy by having more verbiage in there. And that way the supervisor can sit down and catch on as to what you're looking for for point two, for point three as you go through and define it. It takes some work though in the process. So overall, it's easy to develop and, and generalize, but sometimes you still have a problem with congruence between the techniques of the rating scale and the company strategy as you go through. So attribute approach, it's a good way of doing it, but you still are not connecting the goals for the overall organization as you go through. So first of all, we talked about the, the, the first batch as you go through using rankings in the process. And there's three of those attributes. There's, there's two that we're talking about. And now on this section over here, I got three more I want to talk to you about. And this, this is probably, of all things, the most common ones that are used. I call these the behavioral approaches, the three types. The most common one that I've seen out there over the years is called BARS, a behavioral anchored rating scale. It looks an awful lot like this attribute of the mixed standard scales using numbers and words, but we're looking for a little bit different approach on the BARS in, in the process. It really has different numbers and different behaviors approach with that as you go through. There, it's almost really, a, a parallel to the other one as you go through the, 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 this one back over here on the mixed standard scales as you go through. So it's very comparable to that. And it really, it helps you to sit down and focus in on the behaviors. It's very descriptive. It really is excellent as you go through, but you got to pay attention as you go through making certain you're current. Now, the behavioral observation scales, it looks past bars. BARS tends to sit down and, and to have a few more like a paragraph form for each behavior that you're expecting over here. The BARS moves with more, but it has shorter descriptions. So there's more different detail in it, but it gives shorter descriptions. You know, if you study language as you go through, it helps to have shorter sentences as you go through. People have a better retention of it. So really between, between all the ones we talked about so far, this is really my truly favorite one because of the fact it's got short, brief descriptions as you go through. And if you study anything about business communications, shorter is better because it has a better retention rate for those involved with it. So the, the behavioral observation scale is an excellent methodology as you go through for all the behavioral approaches you go through. It's a little bit more detailed than BERS because there's more different comments, but they're shorter in the dimensions as you go through. And then finally, the third one, we call the competency models. And this uses what we call KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities. You'll come across this terminology because of the fact you tend to build your job descriptions 
using the knowledge, skills, and abilities for each job. So all of a sudden now you're going diving into the job description has, what are the knowledge components? What are the skills components? And what are the abilities components as you go through? We also use this when we're recruiting people. So this really follows a really good pattern. We recruit people looking at knowledge, skills, abilities. We create a job description based around knowledge, skills, and abilities. And now we're gonna evaluate them based on knowledge, skills, and abilities. Frankly, this is really has a good continuity from the beginning of employment all the way during the term of their employment as you go through. And it gives the opportunity to sit down and continue the same type of language, the things you're looking for as an employer. It helps the best employees to fill open positions too, because you're evaluating knowledge, skills, and abilities if you've done all of your job descriptions looking at knowledge, skills, and abilities, all of a sudden, here's a lower level job that, that does these things over here for the KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities, and here's another job, and the KSAs could be similar to it. This person is doing fabulous over here. They'll probably fit over here. So you're talking the same language or dialogue in the organization all the way through from recruitment to job description to evaluation. So there's a lot of intelligence and a lot of continuity organizationally in the dialogue and the language you're talking as you go through as to how you operate as an organization. So on a behavior approach, this is an excellent tool to use in a process. So overall, you can link the strategies of the company, big picture wise, to the behavior you're looking for, especially in the knowledge, skills, and abilities process over here. The weaknesses is you got to continually monitor and revise. It takes more time in HR to sit down there and make certain the job descriptions are current, the behavioral analysis is current, and also, of course, the evaluations are current as you go through. It takes work. Okay, but of all of them, in my opinion, this is a phenomenal methodology. Any one of these three will help your organization excel, but you got to put the time and the work in, and your supervisor has to be cognizant of what's going on in their area, because if they're looking and saying, well, I'm not evaluating the right thing. I'm not evaluating anything in this area over here. They have to understand the concept of this is the content of the evaluation, and I'm missing all these cool points they're really doing over here. And over here, why am I asking these questions? You have to have supervisors that are really engaged. And that is not as common as you think as you go through. So, so on this section over here, look on the aspect of really the comparison. You got three different kinds of performance models. One is the comparison, and between that, you got the ranking, the force distribution, and the paired comparison. The second group is called attributes. You're looking at graphic rating skills and a mixed standard. Remember, mixed standard is you're mixing the numbers and the descriptions as you go through. And the third category is called behavioral approaches. There's three of them over here. The bars is very common out there as you go through. The behavioral anchored skills, the behavioral observations, and of course, lastly, the competency models as you go through. These are three of the five overall types of evaluations, but you can see there's variations of them between the three. Here, we have eight different variations of them as you go through. This chapter is really critical, especially if you're going to have a career in human resources, make certain you're paying attention to what these are, not just for the academic part for our tests as we go through, but also long term as a supervisor, if you have this long term, you can also see which one you have and you can have an intelligent dialogue with human resources. Overall, this is really a good beginning for understanding the performance evaluation and what you're looking for to make your employees successful inside your organization and make certain you're linking the employees evaluations to the long-term goals of the organization. Take care.